Agatha is an artist and designer who comes from the UK. I first encountered the project that she's presenting downstairs in the exhibition um, at the degree show at the Royal College of Arts in London um, where she presented it. And back then it caused a complete sensation and here it's doing the same. So we're really pleased to have Agatha with us. Please help, her, help me welcome her to the stage. I'm, I'm super excited to be here and it's uh, such an honor to be involved in this amazing exhibition as well as talking amongst all these amazing speakers. Um, so yeah, I'm Aggie Haynes or Agatha Haynes. Um, I'm an artist, designer and a researcher and I spend a lot of my time looking at how nascent biomedical and healthcare technologies affect how we view the body as a fabric for design. So I'm going to start with this image um, of Michael Phelps, and I'm sure you all know who he is, but he's a really famous swimmer, and a lot of people argue that his body was actually built for this purpose. So his arms have uh, an uh, extra span of three inches longer than his height, which means that he can sort of propel himself further in the water. Uh, his upper body is like a mu much longer than his legs, which is also can, can sort of prevent drag. And then also he has really massive palms and really, really long feet. So it's kind of interesting to think that his form does really benefit his function as a swimmer. But you don't just have to be born with like a swimmer's body, or you don't really have to potentially train in order to sort of build up the muscles to be a swimmer. You could potentially alter your body for this purpose. But, you know, what, what, what's the cost of doing this? So the desire for alteration is really sort of ancient and, uh, and a deep-seated uh, aspiration of humankind. And the surgical procedures involved, I think, have come from quite an, an art and design mindset, utilizing materials and, and forms in order to create new shapes and new functions. And I think that as modifications develop, um, it becomes harder and harder to, to work out where the boundary is between humans and the rest of the outside world. And you see these amazing uh, dentures, for example, are very hard to almost recognize as, uh, whether they're human or not. So a modern drug, for example, might attach to a cell in no less of a significant way than like a, a prosthetic would to, to a limb. So our bodies are capable of this amazing regrowth and regeneration shown through these fantastic old rhinoplasty techniques. Um, and what they would do is sort of borrow areas of the skin to utilize elsewhere to sort of build up shape and form, or even from other areas of the body. And this came from sort of a long line of research about sort of formulating shape. But Harold Gillies was this amazing surgeon who did a lot of research into this. And um, he uh, sort of utilized the idea of a pedicle. And he used this on a lot of uh, soldiers who'd suffered war injuries. So what he did was he would essentially cut a shape um, into the neck, um, fold this over so it was a tube, and let the area underneath heal. And then he could cut this off and use it almost like a sculptor would use modeling clay to build up other areas of the face. So then if you start to think of the body as this sort of maneuverable and modifiable material, you start to sort of see how these amazing surgical procedures have developed, uh, you know, um, in order to sort of you know, view the body that, as something that can be scalpeled, stretched, and sewn to create these amazing different shapes. So we're already kind of being, uh, being designed through things like these amazing maxillofacial surgery techniques. But I find that these images, even though they're totally amazing, aren't really representative of what the patient is going through or even what the practitioner is going through. And I love this because it, it, it kind of looks so simple, like you just cut out a bit, you shift it, and then like in a minute, like they put a few screws in, and it's kind of like, oh, you know, completely new face shape. Um, and, and this kind of shows how, you know, through surgery and, and biomedical sciences, we have become sort of pervious to design intervention. Look, she's got a lovely new face shape. Um, so I myself, I'm, I'm really interested in bone, and I think bone is this really fascinating material. Um, it can grow up to about a millimetre a day when it's, when it's tightened or farmed in a particular direction, for example, with things like orthodontics, so you saw the teeth braces. But also, a lot of people used to do things like this to themselves, you know, um, head binding was something that people would, would personally do to, some, to themselves or someone in their family. And I thought that this was sort of quite interesting because going back to Michael Phelps, <laughs> um, he's got this amazing figure that makes him amazing at sport. 
I'm terrible at sport, <laughs> and I thought it would be really fantastic to try and imagine what I could do to my own body in order to sort of gain a few more seconds on the clock. How could I, how could I sort of compete with someone who, who actually can run quicker or swim faster? So I thought it might be interesting to utilize some of these techniques for alternative purposes. So could you do something like make your face more aerodynamic in order again to run faster and I tried to sort of think about the procedures that you might have to go through in order to achieve this, what areas of the face might you have to move. But most importantly I talked to a few surgeons, I was sort of interested in how long this would take but also what the after effects would be. So this is me wearing a series of prosthetics trying to imagine what it might feel like if your face looked like this, you know, what problems would, would come out of having that, would you get bruising, would it hurt to cough, would you get nosebleeds. Um, and what m might it just generally feel like to look like this. So this was kind of interesting because after doing this experiment, I sort of started thinking of the material of the body. And if you think structurally, uh, when you're adult, it's much harder to modify yourself. And when you're young, your material is much softer and not formed. So it kind of makes sense from a material perspective to potentially modify your children because you know, uh, it might last longer, it would take less time to do the, the sort of, the head binding, for example. But also from a, a parent's perspective, even though this image sort of looks quite shocking now, knowing what we know about the brain and how, how the head forms, from a parent's perspective, this is actually sort of uh, something that you would think of doing to your child, because if it is socially acceptable to have a pointed shaped head, then you would want your child to have a pointed shaped head so it would fit sort of comfortably within the bounds of social norms. And I found this sort of interesting because now knowing what we know about the brain now, it's people think that we should have round shaped heads. And these things sort of, these binding techniques sort of exist but in a slightly different way. So this sort of led to this project which you can see downstairs in the gallery um, that imagines things that parents might do to give their child uh, a better chance of survival later in life, to transfigure them, to make them better. So the first baby was, uh, was based on the, the experiment I did on myself. Um, it imagines it having a more sort of aerodynamic face shape. So this not only could perhaps help the baby move quicker, but it could also live at higher altitude if there's better wind resistance or something like that. This baby has a high head surface area. So you know like elephants have massive ears with a lot of nerves close to the surface. They can get rid of heat much more easily. So this baby would essentially do something similar to that. If, if it had a higher head surface area, it might be able to live more comfortably in the wake of global warming as the planet is potentially getting hotter. Then this child um, has a toe missing. And the reason, of the, the reason it has a toe missing is because there's a, a certain parasite that a lot of people have been researching, hookworm, which can potentially diminish allergies. So in places like South Korea, where the incidence of asthma is, is getting much worse, would it be beneficial to remove a toe in order for you to contract hookworm and then deal with the symptoms that come along with something like asthma as pollution is getting worse? Then this baby has large cheeks. So the cheeks have been stretched in order to absorb more caffeine. So it might just be able to work for longer hours and earn a lot more money than all the other babies. <laughs> and then finally, this baby has a new orifice, so a new hole in a low fatty area, it's like a sort of sphincter. So it could absorb drugs and over a longer period of time. So if it suffered from something like diabetes, this might be helpful, so it's not having to sort of medicate as often. So it's sort of interesting doing this kind of work and exhibiting it to an audience, which in the case of Human Plus is in order to, you know, uh, ask questions or encourage people to ask themselves questions. But it's sort of interesting thinking of um, this sort of artwork or this sort of, uh, these sort of ideas in, in the future of biomedicine as a, as a form of entertainment. And I think a lot of this came from people like Robert Liston. So Robert Liston's one of my favorite uh, <laughs> entertaining surgeons. Um, he, he, I think he holds the record for being able to amputate a leg the quickest in the world ever. And I think he could cut a leg off in 28 seconds, which is, so, and he was so quick, he was like a really big, strong guy, that he, on a number of occasions, actually cut off the fingers of his surgical students who were assisting the, the surgery at the same time. 
Um, but he, yeah, he was this massive entertainer, so when he was showing, he, he would sort of advocate certain technologies in order for people to become more accept, uh, accepting of them through entertainment. So what he would do, he'd like shout to his audience, and I've got a quote that he shouted once. He shouted, um, you've seen me try and assuage the agonies of the knife, and you've seen me use hypnotism and mesmerism. You've seen me use alcohol and laudanum, but today we're going to try a Yankee Dodge to render men insensible. And the Yankee Dodge has sort of now developed into anesthesia. But what he did, this was kind of like really shocking because at the time it was the accepted way was that you would be, uh, you know, put under using hypno hypnosis or mesmerism. So it was actually really shocking that he was trying to advocate anesthesia as a way of, of putting people to sleep before an operation. But what happened was apparently um, a patient came in one day and they uh, administered the anesthetic um, and everyone in the audience went really quiet <laughs> because there was a massive audience who would come to these sort of surgical procedures. And he cut the leg off and then actually he did it so quickly that the, the patient sat up and said, I've decided not to go through with the operation. <laughs> Which was amazing because then the audience went crazy and they were like, wow, they, we've managed to get around pain. Like the, the patient hasn't realized that, this, that his leg has been cut off. And then they, this actually sort of encouraged people to believe in anesthesia. So if you're around this morning, Oren Katz showed, showed these images um, of the babies, the incubating uh, exhibition that went to Coney Island. And again, this is sort of interesting that this was this experiment come entertainment factor that we would show sort of the, the ma maintenance of life as a sideshow attraction. But again, this sort of helped um, encourage uh, incubators for medical use in neonatal units, which is sort of really interesting if you think about the representation of it as, as a sh sideshow event. But I think it's really important to think about how we represent scientific discovery. Um, uh, uh, you know, even though they, they sort of might help with further funding and interest, it's really important to build this sort of sensibility to how medical procedures and those involved are presented, uh, particularly when it involves people who might not be able to make decisions regarding their future at such an early age, which is why I think trying to sort of visualize the future of research is a really important process. And it's interesting to think about how these decisions are made with the use of these sort of representations, which can actually dictate which sort of topics, theories, or, you know, um, tools that are sort of worthy of our, of our scientific or creative efforts, particularly when there are implications that are seen in things like Frankenstein. So Mary Shelley writes something like, um, uh, I think she sort of said, no one can conceive of the enticements of science. So it's sort of interesting that this, this has sort of like gone on to be something that we're slightly nervous about. So how can we comprehend which topics are worth exploring when, you know, the future or even the present of the body is still sort of not really visible to us? So, yeah, through visually simula simulating the sort of future fears and desires of this kind of research, I feel like the results can act as a sort of platform to trigger ideas that can alter maybe how we feel about ourselves in the future, or even maybe help formulate things like research questions. So I'm going to quickly go through a, another couple of my projects uh, that are also about modification. So this one uh, was a collaboration that was part of the BioArt and Design Awards um, with a group of scientists who are based at Erasmus Neuroscience Department. Um, and what we wanted to ask was how could we measure um, what it might be like to change your brain if you were suddenly born within a new anatomy. So if you woke up and you suddenly had a different anatomy, what would happen to your brain? So what we did was we scanned my brain in a diffusion tensor MRI scanner, um, and we utilized this to create an artificial neural network based on the weight of the connections in my brain that spanned across the sort of 3D surface of my brain. And we made 720 nodes with these different weights that had uh, a sort of evolutionary algorithm in them that would update over time. And then we translated this information into a drone that I thought might be quite romantic, floating around the gallery, almost like my thoughts, <laughs> um, I, until it popped. <laughs> and it was so stressful. But um, it, this was sort of quite interesting because we could sort of, which we, we still plan to do, measure how my brain learns over time and measure how the drone changes over time if you did something like replace the functions of the body with like the functions of a toaster or a, a drone or if you woke up without an arm or if you woke up as Marilyn Monroe, what would happen to the structure of your brain? 
Then also, th this is another project that was also shown <laughs> at my uh, MA final show. Um, and I was quite interested in bioprinting. I wrote my MA thesis on it. Um, and this is a, a clip from a surgical video. This is completely fictional. <laughs> and that anyone who knows much about surgery, this will probably look quite fake to you. But the idea was that in bioprinting, I'm sure a lot of you know about it, but it's essentially very similar to 3D printing, but you can print cells in layers to form these complex 3D structures. And the idea of this project was if we can print stuff, why would you print stuff that exists now? Like, why would we print a new kidney when we could print things that would take evolution sort of millions of years to create completely new stuff? So what you're seeing now is essentially like a biological defibrillator. The idea is that it contains cells from an electric eel which can produce a voltage that's high enough to shock the heart. So if you have a heart attack, could this organ trigger the cells from the eel to shock your heart back to its normal beating pattern to sort of circumvent death? And then finally, um, this project, which I did in collaboration with the Varg Society, and they have a, this amazing anatomical theatre in Amsterdam. If you ever visit there, you should really go and have a look. It's amazing. But um, I was sort of thinking about if we, if we are going to start modifying ourselves, perhaps the sort of healthcare systems might need to begin preparing for the modifications that we're coming up with. So the idea of this project, it was a sort of quasi-simulation of like future medicine where I invited an audience to come in and act as medical students and dissect a number of sculptures that I've made that sort of envision what it might be like to do surgery on, on future modified bodies. So, for example, how could you remove a cyst from a bionic eye implant? Or how could we prevent the build-up of something like metallic nanoparticles or nanobots that have accumulated in the lungs? And all of these ideas sort of came from research that's happening at the moment or that's being currently funded. But making this kind of work isn't really that glamorous. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, trying to represent and recreate the future body, even if it's in things like resin and silicons, is very messy, very sticky business, um, and uh, often results in creating a lot of odd materials that, much to my partner's dismay, end up on the kitchen table or on the floor. Uh, <laughs> and the other day, an electrician came around, and I was like, don't look down, it'll be really, <laughs> really awful. But I, I grew up with parents who also make sculpture, and I spent a lot of time working with them, fabricating work for other artists in a, in a sculpture, sculpture studio. So creating the babies felt, felt quite at home, actually. So what I did in order to make them was sort of sculpt from scratch, as well as uh, model onto some dolls, and then take a cast of these babies and, uh, into silicon, so they're sort of this soft, squishy material. But as it's still a sort of learning process, I often came out with some dolls that were unintentionally deformed <laughs> um, and looked like sort of blobfish. And then it's, it sort of goes into like a, a long process of uh, painting and hair insertion, which is uh, essentially using a felting needle to insert hair one at a time. It takes a, a really long time and a lot of watching television. So it's kind of interesting <laughs> to think about uh, the sort of the collaborative process that comes about um, as, as a result of making this kind of work. And I think what's often not mentioned from the arts and design perspective when working with people from other disciplines is that uh, through art and design training you, you are taught this sort of sensitivity to visualization, which I think in a lot of scientific research is, is you know, difficult to have access to, which I think is a, a sort of a quite important collaborative point to mention. Um, but I just want to finish quickly with this image of uh, um, Paul Lothboy, um, uh, who is a sort of famous uh, comic character. So these sort of initial fears that things like alteration might compromise our sense of identity are, are dispelled by the, by the fact, as I said at the beginning, it sort of seems like our innermost desire to alter ourselves that, that kind of makes us human. So again, since Frankenstein was written in 1818, this sort of fear of science has maintained. Um, and perhaps this anxiety isn't just necessarily due to the, the particular technologies, but more to do with the sort of use of knowledge in general. So just because we have the knowledge, it doesn't necessarily invoke the use of it. Not that I'm a Luddite, but I do think that it's important to reflect on the sort of technologies that are coming about. So after sort of 4,000 years of evolution, we barely even tapped the, the vastness of human potential. And it seems like the opportunity of sort of introducing these, you know, um, 
uh, sort of new <laughs> materials that does open the gate for endless sort of bodily possibilities. Um, but we, <laughs> again, going with the comic, feeling any fans of Spider-Man will know with great power comes great responsibility. And, and I think more thought does need to be put into utilizing a material that we have such a biological connection with, um, especially when the products and things might sort of become ourselves. So I think technological innovation is sort of part and parcel of the, the development of exploring humanity and exploring the world around us. So our designs for life might, you know, as this section is about, become our next steps in evolution. But not only that, I think it's not just now a question of technological possibility, but it's also one of human character that might actually push us forward into the next phase of e evolution. So yeah, thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aggie, for uh, that wonderful tour through the sculptural studio, and hopefully uh, we don't have too many squeamish folk in the audience. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a real thrill to have our next speaker here because he's going to be presenting some really cutting edge and important work um, that's been undertaken right here in Singapore. Um, Dr. Trevor Bindell is the Assistant Head of Prosthetics and Orthotics at Tan Tok Seng Hospital right here in Singapore and the Foot Care and Limb Design Centre. And in that capacity, over the past 13 years, Trevor's been involved with working with um, a range of different patients um, on uh, assistive technology, on prosthetics that you know, kind of are, are life transformational for patients. He's also worked with athletes um, and indeed some of Singapore's most well-known athletes um, who are part of the Paralympian movement. And many of you will be familiar with Singapore's own blade runner, Muhammad Sharif Abdullah. Um, Trevor's worked directly with him on the technology which has enabled him to become such a star. So we're thrilled to have him with us. Please, a big warm welcome to Dr. Trevor Bindell. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I have been here in Singapore for 13 years. I do like curry um, and spicy foods for those that want to ask, yes. Um, I'm principal prosthetist and the assistant head at Tantok Seng Hospital for the prosthetics department. Um, it's quite strange to be able to talk to uh, the public about what I do. Generally, you read about it in the newspapers, you read about what Sharif has done, you read about uh, different uh, other patients like Tekwa running in the Paralympic, uh, Para-Asian Games. Um, you read about wheelchair athletes racing as well. Um, pretty much all of those patients are my patients and um, um, I take great joy in seeing their successes, not just um, what I create, but, but seeing how they use what I create as well. And I think um, uh, talking in a, in a forum like this where I'm talking to arts faculty or arts students or, 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 or um, people in those uh, humanitary, uh, humanity um, areas is a bit different because I usually talk to doctors and surgeons and, and other medical professions. So my slides had to tweak a little bit so it's a little bit more interesting for you and less interesting for surgeons out there. Um, so I wanted to start with, with this picture here. This is uh, showing the, the humanity side of what I deal with day in, day out. These are patients that have suffered traumatic loss often suddenly if they're, if they're young. Um, in Singapore, the older patients typically are diabetic. Uh, about 80 to 90% of our patients are diabetic patients. Um, and there are some links to gender, there are some links to race as well. Um, but the young patients typically are traumatic. They're either motorbike accidents um, or sudden, you know, I've had people fall off trains. Um, from, from other countries and they come to Singapore seeking medical help because in this region there's just not enough um, prosthetists in the world to, to see everybody. But when I see patients like this, the, the question we want to ask is, is there a future for him? Now, it's, it's my job to encourage that future, it's not to dictate his future. Now I can look at this patient and I can encourage him to get back and walking, I can encourage him to, to try the prosthetic limb that he's looking at. Um, but I cannot make him do it. It's a bit like leading a horse to water. You cannot make it drink. So 
when I look at this patient, he's in despair. He's going to go through depression. He's going to have anxiety. And I need to look at how I can create a future for him and whether there is a future for him. And the answer is yes. This is a patient from Cambodia. Um, many of you would know that Cambodia has a lot of landmines um, and typically they're younger patients as well. So they may step on an unexploded landmine. Um, and you can see there with the picture on the right, his prosthetic limb is a very old fashioned limb, but that seems to be what's happening in our industry still. Even if you look at an upper limb from 1912, it's still relatively the same design that we have now. Yes, there's electrics and there's my, uh, bionics that are helping, but it's not reaching the poor. And that's where most of the patients are. So this patient may walk around on crutches, he may use his leg, but he does look fairly happy. But that's what's happening in this part of the world. In America or Western countries, this is what you see day in, day out. Now, do I want to go and work in places like this where I can make this technology? The picture you see at the back there, his back leg is in Singapore, it would cost over $100,000. His front leg maybe would cost between uh, maybe five or $6,000. Now, you compare that to the leg that was in the previous slide, which was probably about $30. Now, uh, I was sharing with Agatha earlier that uh, in the UK, there's about 1,000 amputees returning from war, and uh, there's about 64,000 amputees in the UK. But the technology is focusing on the only the 1,000. They're trying to improve that 1,000, not necessarily the 63,000 that may require a different form of technology. So what's my role? My role is to encourage them to achieve what they want to achieve. I don't set limits. Um, Muhammad Sharif, that you, you heard about in the introduction, um, when he came to see me, I asked him, what does he want to do? He said he wanted to run. And I said, OK, let's make you run. And he had never heard that before. And, and I said, OK, let's just start with something simple, because running is not so easy. As you'll see later on, you'll see it looks very easy but it takes many, many years of dedicated training to reach that. So you can see here just a, a flow of, of the journey that a patient may go through from an accident, through the surgery, through the rehabilitation process, learning to walk again, and then finally to running. But of course, there's other possibilities as well. You can do mountain climbing, and you see people like Hugh Herr that were mountain explorers in their, yeah, before their accidents. And actually, when I first started the profession, um, when I was a student in Australia, uh, one of the guys lost both his legs and he called himself part human, part machine. And now he's gone on to do many presentations based on that. But there's many possibilities. There's also cycling. You can see here the cycling blade. Um, so it just connects. There's no foot. It goes straight into the pedal. And they're able to push and ride just as fast as an able-bodied athlete. And that's remarkable. But I had a conversation with a guy only two days ago who looks after the, the, the cyclists in Singapore. And some of them are my patients that want to ride. And he told them, get rid of your leg. It's slowing you down. Now, do I get offended at that? Not at all. Because he's saying to the, to the, to the athlete, if you get rid of your leg, you can, you can then qualify in the games at a lower category, which gives you a better chance of winning. So there's different angles to approach how you, rep how you replace what happens to a, to a patient. Do you give them a limb? Yes. But can that limb be used just for cycling? Can it be used just for running? Can it be used just for climbing? The actual human leg can be used for all those things. But in prosthetics, we have to create one for each purpose. And that sometimes adds to the cost. Let's have a look at this video here, if it plays. This is the London 2012 100 meters. Now you notice there I said it's a new Paralympic record. How fast do you think Johnny Peacock ran? Any questions? I mean, any answers? I've got the questions. Any answers? Come on, this is more interactive. <laughs> when I talk to my class, or when I talk to students at, at the different universities, I get them engaged. So who thinks that it's less than 10 seconds? Between 10 and 11 seconds. Over, than, over 11? Yeah. 
So this time, at a new Paralympic record, was 10.9. How fast do you think Usain Bolt ran? Less than 10 seconds. I think it was something like 9.6 or as his record, 9.58 or something like that. So he's still almost one and a half seconds faster than the best para-athlete there is at the 100 meters. So there's still a long way to go. The blades that you see them running on essentially function like springs. This is a patient from Myanmar that I looked after at the recent Singapore ASEAN Games. And you can see a good demonstration of how these blades work to provide the spring. This is the Usain Bolt of ASEAN. He walks around with sunglasses, collar turned up. You know, he's very famous. As soon as he walks into the, to the cafeteria, everybody stops and looks at him. You know, he has a real strut about himself. He's very confident. So has the leg given him that confidence? Probably. It's actually enabled him to achieve what he thought he wanted to achieve and has able to do. But let's look at the height. So next question. Do you think if you had higher legs, you would run faster? Or if you had shorter legs, you would run faster? And by legs, I mean blades. Yeah, as a prosthetist, we, they're all legs. Yeah. So who thinks they run faster? If you have longer legs, will you run faster? Yeah. If you had shorter legs, would you run faster? That would be the rest of you. Yeah. The person on the left is Oscar Pistorius. You may have heard of him. I will talk about him in a good light, not in the recent light. But he serves as a really good example. The person on the right is from Brazil. Uh, his full name, I cannot remember. His surname is like Oliveira. Now, um, I'll show you the, the video, and then we'll talk about what you see. Uh, Oscar Pistorius, uh, for those who don't know, is a South African athlete, now behind bars, um, but he was a pioneer for blade running uh, around the world. Um, and in 2012, the Brazilian that you'll see, um, he, he was more of an unknown. And so if you hear the commentary, you might see um, just what I mean. So again, this is at uh, the 2012 London Paralympics. So the commentators say Oscar Pistori is tired. I don't think that's the case. I think the, the blades definitely give to an, a, do give an advantage. And uh, in the press conference afterwards, Oscar was very upset. And uh, when at the time I was working at the Paralympics, um, the, the word came back to us when we were working as the technical support crew um, that this was the case and that he was upset that the Brazilian had beaten him with longer blades. And our simple reply was, well, why don't you make your blades longer? But of course, for Oscar, as you'll see later on, he, um, he was a congenital amputee, and um, uh, that's the, the, the size he's always run with. That's what he's comfortable with. Now, the, the Brazilian, he can choose what height he wants to be. But there are regulations. So the Athletics Federation does say you can only be a certain height. You cannot be six foot, seven foot, and then run. But what you should note is how fast these blades pick up speed. And by pickup speed, I mean they're actually very, very slow. If you see at the start, he's a good 30 meters behind at the, front, at, the, at the last 100 meters. But towards the end, he starts to make up all the speed. And there's actually a very famous uh, above knee amputee from the UK as well, um, who does the same thing. He comes from miles behind, and then he wins all the races, or most of the races. But let's talk a little bit about Oscar. Of course, or some of you may know that he competed in the able-bodied Olympics as well as the Paralympics in 2012. This is him finishing his semi-final. He didn't make the final, but what he did do was open up doors for the disabled athletes. In my line of work, that's very important because that shows hope for those that may not see hope. That shows a, a dreams that can come true. And it also breaks down the disability stereotypes that we see in our society. The blades, do they give an advantage or not? Well, I think they do in some ways, 
and they've been proven to. They are lighter when you want to run through the air, so you bring the blade through the air, it's much lighter, and it's faster. There's less resistance, makes sense. But where it falls down is when it contacts the ground or the, or the track. Your human foot is able to grip onto the track and use the intrinsic muscles inside the foot. Don't worry, I won't get too anatomical for you. Um, and basically grab the ground and be able to propel themselves forward. Technology has slowly caught up to this ability of being able to push off the ground. The spring more or less works absorbing the energy and then releasing the energy. How much it compresses, then how much it releases. Then that determines how fast you will go. So it's not at the stage where we're surpassing what human, what able-bodied athletes are able to do. But what we are trying to do as prosthetists is just trying to regain that level of function that perhaps makes them able to compete on a more level playing field. So the, the, the wise heads at the Athletics Federation may say it's giving them an unfair advantage or, it, or, or they may say it's not. But what's interesting is they always say to the athlete, you have to prove that it's not giving you an advantage, which is kind of a negative way of looking at it because they're just trying to play catch up and we're just trying to give them the best opportunity to do so. Incidentally, if you are an amputee in the future, make sure it's your right leg if you want to run. Studies have shown that 4% faster if you're a right-legged amputee running around the track. If you're a left leg, it's on the inside, you have less power going around the corners. Yeah, I don't wish that on anybody. Let's have a look at this video. So this is third attempt. Head top, 669 in the first round. Right, so eminently successful. Not bad, right? So this is the World Championships in 2015. He jumps off the blade, which is not a, what a lot of athletes do. Does he have an unfair advantage? There's a lot of gasps in the audience when you see him jump past the screenshot. His distance was 8 metres 40. How far do you think the winner at the 2012 able-bodied Olympics jumped? Who thinks more or less? Less, that's right. So the winner jumped 8 metres 31. If he had jumped at that time, he would have won the, the Olympic gold. He would have achieved much more than Oscar would have. But as it, as it stands, he was unable to compete in the Rio 2016 Games. Again, he had to go and prove that the blade did not give him an advantage. Now, if I look at that video just like you, you will see that it clearly gives him an advantage. But only the last part, only the blade at the end where he springs. What they show is that at the start, he's very slow in the run-up. It takes a lot of time, like I said earlier, to build that speed up. And we know if we have more speed, he's going to jump further. That's why 100-meter sprinters make very good long jumpers. So he's unable to build that speed as fast as an able body athlete, yet he's able to jump further. Now, in my simple mind, that seems to cancel each other out, and he should be able to compete. But that's not what they said. You have to prove that it doesn't give you an advantage. He went to the same university that Oscar went to to prove the same thing, and they said the same thing. You cannot compete because we don't know either way whether it's going to give you an advantage or not. In some areas it does, in some areas it doesn't. So I would probably not encourage other athletes to keep going to that same university if they want to compete in the able-bodied Olympics. This guy, he's, he's from Germany and he suffered an, in, an injury um, much later in life. He was a propeller, he got, fell off a boat when he was skiing and he got his leg caught. So we are replacing what he has lost but are we enhancing what he's able to do? Would he be a normal or a very good long jumper had he not lost his leg? Or does sport give him an avenue to try new things, to um, venture into, into unknown territory to see what an athlete's able to do? I think it's great that he's breaking down barriers for other athletes. It's still a shame that he's unable to compete in the able-bodied. This is what Oscar looks like. This was at his trial and the judge made him walk to show how he would have walked to the bathroom to shoot his girlfriend. 
He says, I was vulnerable because I don't have my legs. Now I look at that and yes, I feel he's vulnerable. This is not how we are meant to walk, but this is how he is walking. So how do I, when I see a patient like this, how do I turn him into something like that? Now in Singapore, we don't have many athletes that are able to run, which is why most of my photos and videos are from um, uh, overseas. I do have very poor quality videos if you want to see them later on. But the blade runners in themselves, they, they just try to compete with the able-bodied. They don't necessarily surpass what the able-bodied are able to do. And that's the next step. Now, whether it's involving um, uh, newer technologies that you hear about uh, at this conference, um, or whether it's just uh, someone developing new materials that are able to leap tall buildings, for example, um, or we're not really sure. But the te technology is improving. The thing that I want to talk about here is the sockets, the part that the patient wears on his stumps. Now you can see here he has the black carbon fibre around his leg. Now that's not necessarily a very comfortable material. You're sitting on a nice comfortable soft seat and already you probably start to want to shift position. Imagine having something very hard that doesn't move, um, grabbing hold of your leg, which is essentially just a lot of bones in Oscar's case. So what am I able to do to try and bring it back to the art side for you? I'm able to design sockets that may have some aesthetic appearance. So I can make Spider-Man sockets, I can make horse riding sockets, I can make tattooed styled sockets, or I can make entire legs. Now these are all for different patients. The first one, believe it or not, is for a 60 something year old gentleman. He wants a Spider-Man socket. And just yesterday I fitted a pink, bright pink socket to an 18 year old male who wants to go to Thailand next week for a month to invest. Now I'm not judging, but you know, if you want to do that, he's got orange hair, he's got very colorful boots, he's, he's like that. Now we're able to give him some, um, some cosmetic appearance to that leg. It makes him want to wear it more. Now isn't that a good thing? Even if it's still uncomfortable, it's still a carbon fiber socket. The outside can make it so attractive that they want to put it on every day. The last leg that you see there, we made the socket first with the skulls and then we made a cover for it. It's not typically done. Nowadays you're able to 3D print these types of things, but the designs are, are, are typically more structure-based designs, they're not necessarily prints. We can print um, and, and we can make it like this. This guy's a gym instructor, personal trainer. And after this, he's able to now wear shorts with pride because a lot of his clients didn't know that he was an amputee. Now is it great that he's, he's able to hide that he's an amputee? Does that mean that I've done a really good job? Or do I take more pride in the fact that he's now able to wear shorts and show off his leg? It's the latter. So what do I do? I take a mold of the patient's leg. Prosthetists will do this to every single patient, whether it's an arm, a shoulder, a hip, half a body, whatever. We do the same thing. Technology hasn't really changed very much, but recently, now you're able to scan, you're able to interpret images in a different way and digitize everything, and then you can make modifications. And if patients want the same thing again, you can, you can replicate it very easily, exactly the same. Because they're so customized, when a patient comes back in the current technology, if we're not digitizing, we're unable to make it exactly the same. And sometimes we can spend up to 18 months trying to get it exactly the same. So we have a lot of patients. If I didn't need to make a socket, this is technology called osseo integration. Now this technology you can see is a, a metal sticking straight out of a person's bone. This is actually a patient in Singapore, except for the middle picture. I'll show you the video. Yeah. I like the clicks. It's not his knee, that's actually just the screw going in. Now this is a titanium implant that goes straight into the femur of the patient's leg. It's done in multiple stages. Uh, it's only done by about three surgeons in the world. But we do have Singapore surgeons that are interested in this technology. Um, but there's still a high chance of infection. Uh, I think it's somewhere between 70 and 90% of ev patients will have an infection of some sort. The advantages you, you should be able to work out by now. You sit on a soft, comfortable socket. You don't have any issues. But let me ask you this, would you want to go long jump with this? 
I probably wouldn't. Yeah. So it does have the ability to fail. It, it, it can break, but the main thing is the infections. The newer technology, you can see on the right, the far right picture there, you can see how it's sort of calloused around the, the titanium implant. Uh, nowadays, what they're trying to do is make that movable so that the, the, the plate will slide, the skin will slide around it so it doesn't have this same level of friction which may improve patient's comfort and compliance and um, less infections. But that's the newest technology. But what I want to end with here is how do we turn a disability into an ability? That's what a prosthetist tries to do. We try to look at the human side of it, we look at their despair, we look at their current situation, we look at their psychological state, and we coach them through a process, sometimes over two years, three years, before they become athletes. It's not like you just have an amputee and then you, an amputation, and then you can just start running. It doesn't happen. It's like one of those earlier slides I showed you. It's a complete rehabilitation process. It requires strong family support, and in this part of the world, it does require a little bit of financial help as well. But I wanted to leave you with this picture that, uh, you know, there's always some ability within the disability. So thank you. Thank you very much, Trevor, for um, that inspiring and insightful presentation about um, progress which is happening right now today within the medical community across the world and especially here in Singapore. It's a really important perspective, I think, for us to kind of have a mind. Um, I'm sure many of you are here to see our next speaker, um, Neil Harbison. Um, we're absolutely thrilled that she's here with us in Singapore. Um, he's a key part of Human Plus, the future of our species, our new exhibition staged with Science Gallery and CCCB. Um, and uh, he is the world's first governmentally recognized cyborg. Um, and so having him here for a discussion about how science and technology is shifting the possibilities of our bodies and perhaps um, laying the framework and the first steps towards a kind of new evolution um, within the human species is a real thrill. He's the co-founder of the Cyborg Arts Foundation together with Moon Rebaus, who is also presented in the exhibition uh, downstairs. And today he's going to be giving a presentation almost in two parts. Um, firstly, um, a, a talk about his practice um, and his work, and then he's going to be joined by his collaborator, Albert Benajam, who you'll meet very shortly, um, who will perform with Neil uh, for a few moments' time. So please, a very warm Singapore welcome for Neil Harbison. Thank you. Well, I was born completely colorblind, so I've never actually seen a color. I don't know what blue or yellow looks like. So as a child, I was really curious about what color was. But uh, I didn't want to change my sight, because seeing black and white has many advantages. I see better at night. I can also see longer distances, because color doesn't interfere. Uh, I memorize shapes more easily as well, and photocopies are cheaper in black and white. So this was always a great advantage. So I didn't want to change my sight, but I wanted to have a sense of color, because even if I can't see color, I, it's impossible to ignore that color exists, because people keep mentioning color every single day in daily elements, like yellow pages, Bluetooth, Greenpeace, orange, the Red Cross, Pink Panther, Red Bull, uh, James Brown, it's in his last name, Greenland, huge country that also has a color. Um, so I kept hearing the names of color. Also, when you use it as a cold, hot water and cold water, sometimes they only use codes. Uh, maps also. This is fine, but if I go to Tokyo, I can get easily lost because some <laughs> maps only use color codes. Also, when I was learning the colors of flags, I had this situation. <laughs> so three countries share exactly the same flag. And also, if someone would ask me, have you seen a man with ginger hair, blue eyes, and dressed in pink? I would have absolutely no idea. The only information I get here is that the man has hair, that he has eyes, and that he's not naked, basically. So I wanted to have a sense of color without changing my sight. I wanted to have a new input, a new sensory input for color. And I realized that there's been many theories relating color and sound. Newton created one centuries ago. So I was interested in hearing color. And in 2003, I started a project with a friend in order to create uh, some kind of uh, way of hearing the sounds of color. Each color has a light frequency. 
if you scale down the light frequency 39 octaves, then it becomes audible to the, in, in the middle of the, the piano scale. So then simply by dividing the light frequencies by two, uh, there was a point when I was able to hear the colors with the software. So I memorized the sound of each color, and then I, I kept learning that the F is red and blue is C sharp. And I uh, kept upgrading the software until I was able to distinguish 360 microtones for different um, hues. This is how I hear color. So it's sine waves. We hear from red to orange. So at the beginning, it was extremely chaotic. There's color everywhere. So I suddenly was living in uh, electronic music wherever I looked. So I had to get used to this new reality. And in the end, it became normal. We also added different volume levels depending on saturation. So if it's vivid color, I hear it louder. And then there was a point I was able to distinguish all colors just like you without seeing them, but through sound. And I see the, didn't see why I should stop there because there's many colors that exist that the humans could not sense, like infrareds and ultraviolets. So I uh, added infrared and ultraviolet perception as well uh, after a few years. And then this suddenly allowed me to sense more colors than you, uh, which was a, a surprise because uh, suddenly I was sensing colors that no one could actually see. Infrared is practical because it allows me to know if there's movement detectors in a room, so I can tell if the alarms are on or off in shops or banks. So it's, in many cases, they are off. Ultraviolet is practical. It allows me to know if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe. If I sense that there's a high level of ultraviolet, I avoid the sun or I put some cream. I didn't want to use a wearable, and I didn't want to use a tool. I didn't want to use technology. I wanted to become technology. I wanted to have a new body part because I felt it was more practical. I didn't want to use a sense. I wanted to have a sense. At the beginning, I thought of having a third eye implanted in the middle of my head, but this would limit my color perception to what I have in front. So I looked at nature and I saw there's many animals that have antennas. So I thought the best thing would actually be having an antenna because an antenna would allow me to sense th colors 360 degrees or sense the colors up in the sky while I'm looking straight. So separating sight from from uh, color perception was my aim. So I designed an antenna with friends and when the antenna was done, I went to the doctor and I said, I wanted an antenna implant. And he said, sorry, we don't do this here. If you want an antenna implant, you have to go through a bioethical committee. So I presented the surgery to the bioethical committee and they said it was not ethical to have this antenna implanted in my head for three main reasons, because it's not regenerating a pre-existing sense, it's not regenerating a pre-existing body part, and because they were extremely worried about the image the hospital would have if someone came out with an antenna sticking out of the head. So they said no to the surgery. Uh, but then I tried to find a doctor willing to do the surgery anonymously, and we found one. So this is basically my head facing down. The hair was uh, removed, Some, uh, the skin was reduced, and then my head was drilled four times to, for four different implants. One is the chip that vibrates depending on the light frequency. Another one is uh, two, chip, uh, no, two structures to hold the... Uh, the antenna, and the fourth implant is uh, internet connection, so I can receive colors from external devices. So uh, the antenna and my head took two months to merge, so this is now part of my skeleton, and I'm officially taller now, because this is part of my body. So the internet connection, I use it uh, to receive colors from other parts of the world. There's five people that have permission to send colors to my head, one in each continent. The person in Asia now has been substituted by the sculpture that is here in, uh, in this uh, exhibition. In Humans Plus, there's a sculpture where if you put a color underneath, I will receive this color in my head wherever I am in the world. So I will be receiving lots of colors in the next few months. The thing with, when I receive colors is that uh, suddenly I can sense a sunset in Australia. If I'm here, but my friend from Melbourne starts streaming live images to my head from a sunset, then I, I, I can suddenly feel that I'm witnessing a sunset. Or if people start sending colors at night, then my friends can actually color my dreams or they can alter my dreams. So if someone starts sending blue, my dream might suddenly become blue. So this is the use of the internet as a sense or a sensory extension, which is something we'll start seeing much more in the 2020s. This is an MRI scan of my brain. I feel no difference between the software and my brain anymore. And this is when I started feeling cyborg, the union between cybernetics and organism. And that's what I tried to explain to the UK government in 2004, because I tried to renew my passport, and they said, well, there's a problem with the picture, uh, that there's uh, electronic equipment is not allowed on passport photos. So this is how the battle between the UK passport office and me started uh, trying to um, convince them that this should be allowed because I identify as a cyborg. I feel that this is a body part, 
and I feel that the software is an extension of my senses. In the end, they said yes, and they allowed me in 2004 to appear with the first prototype of the antenna, and this allowed me to travel. Um, I'm now actually applying for Swedish citizenship because all the materials I use to create the antenna are Swedish, so I am Swedish. I am telling them that. <laughs> so uh, I'm in conversations with the government. I think there should be a six point in the requirements for becoming cit Swedish citizen. One would be if you have a Swedish body part, you are also entitled. So we'll see what they reply. My life has changed in many ways. Now I dress in a way that it sounds good because I can hear color, so I can wear C major. This would be a C major combination. This is a minor chord. Uh, I would dress like this in a funeral, for example. And you can also wear songs. Depending on how you design the clothes, you can wear uh, music. This is a tie that I designed that sounds like electronic music. So when I look at the tie, I can hear the, the melody that I like. The longer the tie, the longer the melody. Also, interior design has changed. I can now paint a house so that it sounds good. Uh, so I like floors to be red because it's the lowest frequency, so it gives a profound sound to the house. Uh, living rooms, if they're pink, uh, blue, and yellow, sound C major. And bedrooms, I would like them always to be in three different colors. Turquoise, which is B. Uh, violet, which is, no, pink, which is E. And violet, which is D. So you have B, E, and D. Bed, which makes sense to have it in the bedroom, these three colors. So it's changed the way I sense uh, houses as well. Also food, because I can compose music with food now. Depending on how I put the food on the plate, I can eat a song. So I've been collaborated with a restaurant where you can actually experience this. It's a plate that has an antenna, and when you rotate, you can hear it, hear the sound of the colors with an amplifier. So you can go to the restaurant and ask for some Mozart as main dish or some Lady Gaga dessert if you want. So now I can compose music by looking at things. I no longer need to play an instrument. Uh, I can just place different colors in front of me, and then I can compose different color combinations. The issue is that I'm the only one hearing the music, but you can also amplify this through Bluetooth or through microphones that conduct to the bone. So I really enjoy walking around supermarkets now because that's where I find most colors. It's like going to a nightclub because supermarkets have many different colors, especially the aisles with cleaning products because it has unusual and unexpected combinations of colors. I still haven't gone to a Singapore supermarket, but that's my first thing that I'm going to do tomorrow is go to the supermarket to listen to the different uh, colors in each aisle. So this is just an example of different sounds. Milk is silent, so. <laughs> I also enjoy listening to art, because uh, now all painters have become composers. I can listen to a Picasso, I can listen to an Andy Warhol, I can listen to the Scream, because all colors create unique harmonies. You can easily distinguish a painter from another by just hearing the, the colors. For example, uh, Andy Warhol usually sounds very loud because uh, it's very saturated, so you can hear an Andy Warhol from the other end of the museum usually. As you see, it's very uh, saturated. Also, the way I sense people has changed because when I look at someone's face, I can hear their face, so I like doing sound portraits where I write down the sound of the eyes, the lips, the skin, and the hair, and then I send them an MP3 of their face so they can listen to themselves. So the first sound portrait I did was Prince Charles. I asked him if I could listen to his face and this was his reaction when I asked him. <laughs> so today I'll be doing, after the talk, a sound portrait live so you can hear uh, a face. Uh, for example, Judy Dench had silent hair. James Cameron had very, very high-pitched sound of skin. Al Gore has different notes in his eyes because he has different shades of turquoise. Steve Reich had the melody in his eyes, so he's had different patterns. Steve Wozniak's eyes sounded like green apples. Moby sounded less than other people because he has no hair, so it's one note less than other people. Uh, Robert De Niro had very high-pitched sound of lips, very unusual high pitch. Woody Allen, very soft, unsaturated. Uh, Philip Glass, very microtonal. And uh, Bono had very loud glasses here. It's a shade of turquoise. What really shocked me through the years is that people who say they're black, they're not black, and people who say they're white, they're not white. People who say they're black, they're actually very, very dark orange, and people who say they're white, they're very, very light orange. So the fact that people say that we are black and white is completely false. We are all orange. <laughs> so this is an example of a face concert where I can create rhythms from people's faces. 
Uh, usually I do it with an audience, so audience cues, and then I start playing music and rhythms from someone's face. So if the concert sounds really bad, it's their fault, because that's where the music comes from. This is what we'll be, we'll be doing just in a minute. The last face concert was of Prince Albert II of Monaco. He likes the sound of his face so much that he's using it as his ringtone now. So. So when we started this project, we had no idea if it would have secondary effects. The secondary effect basically is that when I hear sounds, I also feel colors. The aim was that color would become sound, but sound has also become color. So now I can paint what I hear. This is Mozart's Queen of the Night, note by note on a canvas. And this is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber on a canvas, which turns out very pink. <laughs> These are also speeches. When we talk, we use different frequencies, so you can transpose them to color. Also, other musicians can use this code, so they don't use a score. Uh, the, the score is actually the lights on stage. Also, public sculptures, where you can download an app and then you can hear a melody when you walk underneath the sculpture. This is the free app that people can download. Also, at night, different projections create different music, so through the app you can hear music through the color. So, having an antenna has also uh, created a lot of social interaction because I, when I go in the street, people stop at me and ask me what it is or they are curious or they just go, run or they laugh at me. So it have different types of reaction. What has changed is what people think it is. In 2004, most people thought it was a reading light and they would ask me if I could turn on the light. <laughs> in 2005, six, they thought it was a microphone, like a chat microphone. 2007, they thought it was a hands-free telephone that I had, uh, like a taxi, uh, taxi drivers had uh, this, 2009, 10, they thought it was a GoPro cam that I was filming my life. Uh, so people would wave at me like I was filming them. In 2011, 12, um, it was something, people asked if it was something to do with Google Glass because it was on the news. 2014, 15, people thought it was an extendable selfie stick that I could take some <laughs> selfies. And since last year, people just shouted at me Pokemon and they tried to catch me. So it changed. <laughs> Hopefully, in the 2020s, people will just think it's a, a new body part, uh, a new sensory organ. The Cyborg Foundation was created in 2010 to help other people extend their senses and create new organs. We also created, the, with collaboration with, with friends, uh, Cyborg Bill of Rights. And some of the project we've done is these uh, uh, earrings that vibrate whenever there's presence in front of you, so you can feel movement. Depending on the interval, you can slowly gain the sense of speech, so you can tell if someone's walking at three per hour, five per hour. If you turn them around, you can sense if there's someone behind you, so you get rearception. We also created the seismic sense, which is inside Moon's, Moon's arm. It's also exhibited here. It's a replica of her arm. Whenever there's an earthquake in the world, she feels a vibration in her body, so she's feeling the constant activity, seismic activity of the planet, so it's like a second heartbeat. She has her own heartbeat and the earth beat, she also now has a new implant, which will allow her to sense the moon quakes. So whenever there's seismic activity in the moon, she will also feel a vibration. And I also use the internet connection to connect to satellites so I can sense colors from space. I connect to NASA's International Space Station, and then I can sense extraterrestrial colors. Doing this allows us to explore space without having to physically go there. I, we call this becoming a sense thrown out, where you send your senses to space, and then you feel you there, and then you come back. So, I think we'll see also a new ways of exploring space by sending our senses there instead of physically going there. We also created the north sense that placed in the middle of your body allows you to feel where the north is and then you gain a sense of uh, orientation. So basically I think becoming a cyborg doesn't really bring us closer to machines but it brings us closer to other species because uh, in my case I feel now more connected to my cat. We share the sense of infrared. I feel more connected to bees. We share the sense of ultraviolet. And I feel connected to many insects because we share a body part, an antenna. Also, uh, I think we are all trans species. We are human now, but we, not, we were not human millions of years ago. So we are constantly transforming ourselves. And now we are witnessing what is probably, we'll be seeing as the renaissance of our species, where we are merging with technology and we can decide what species we want to be. We can decide what senses and organs we want to have. Just uh, some up, just that last year we did some little projects. One was I have a tooth missing, so I didn't want to have it replaced with a normal tooth, so I put a small lead in my tooth, so in case of emergency, have, I can click and I have emergency light in my mouth. So this is also creating light in total darkness. Some species can do this. If you have a tooth missing, it's much better to have it replaced with a small lead inside, so that you can also create light. During this period, my friend Moon also lost the tooth, so we decided to create 
uh, two uh, teeth that would allow us to communicate to each other. So one tooth was placed in my mouth, the other tooth was placed in Moon's mouth, this was in Brazil, and then whenever I click, Moon receives a vibration in her mouth, and then she can click, and then I receive a vibration in my mouth. So we call this transdental communication system. We both know uh, the Morse code, so depending on the rhythm, we can communicate via Morse code from tooth to tooth. It works via the mobile phone, so from the tooth to the mobile, mobile to mobile, and then mobile to tooth. So it's actually a Bluetooth tooth that allows you to communicate <laughs> from mouth to mouth. We did the first public demonstration in Sao Paulo last year. The audience was giving us words, and then we were transmitting the word to each other, and in actu it, it worked pretty well. So just to end, what I'm doing now is a new sense. I've had the, this antenna for 13 years, so I feel I'm ready for adding a new sensory organ, and it will be a sensory organ for the sense of time. We all have a sense of time, but we don't have an organ for the sense of time. Uh, so I'm creating this uh, circular implant. It will be around my head, and it will give me a point of heat that will slowly go around my head. It, it will take 24 hours to go around the head. So I will feel what time it is by feeling the point of heat around my head. Uh, in theory, after a few months or years, I will have a precise sense of time. Whenever this happens, I'll see if I can modify my perception of time. So if I want the situation to last longer, I'll program the heat to go a bit faster or a bit slower. Or if I want to travel in time, I'll just make it spin a few times so that I feel that I'm traveling in time. So it's, trying to see if we put Einstein's theory of time relativity into practice. If we have an organ for the sense of time, we might be able to modify our perception of time and in the end also modify your perception of age. So you could uh, use it in a way that you feel that you are 150 years old, but you might just be 70. So I'm planning to do this so that when I'm 80 years old and I look at myself in the mirror, I might think that I'm 160 and I feel great because I'll feel that I'm 160 years old, but I'll have a body of a 70 year old man. So that's the current project I'm doing. And that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. And we'll just do a sound portrait now so you can hear the sounds of colors. Thank you. <laughs> so, we come to, uh, so, um, to, I'll do the sound portrait of an artist from Barcelona called Albert Benajam. So, if he's around, he can come up on stage. <laughs> um, so makeup makes people sound more, uh, usually. So uh, I asked him to, to put some makeup on so that he sounds much more than a uh, usual face. So maybe I'll start with the skin. Most of you sound like this. It's F sharp, shade of orange. Now you're hearing the orange and the yellow.
This is how he sounds like. <laughs> Thank you. and answers. size with your with your answers as well so we can take as many questions as possible hello uh, my question is for Neil um, I loved every bit of your presentation uh, my question is a little bit far-fetched um, it's um, it's basically about if we as humans are going to go in in the future for enhanced abilities it's also to some extent gonna come down to financial wherewithal so the people with the financial backing can probably go in for more superior implants that will give them more superior uh, abilities. So in the distant future, are we looking at sort of creating some kind of a greater inequality wherein you know, the richer can become more superior and the poorer people uh, sort of end up becoming the inferior race? And say we set ourselves up for a scenario where that happens, um, what can we do today or how can we start thinking today on what lines can we think where we are setting boundaries and regulation so that we do not, you know, worsen the gap between uh, the people in, in, the, in the world. Yeah. Well, that's the main function of the Cyborg Foundation, which is uh, to make this uh, available to everyone. But actually, the, the technology is very simple, the ones uh, to to have new senses is technology that we have already been using for decades, but we've been giving these senses to machines. The, the only difference is applying these senses to our own bodies. So if we want, it's not a matter of money. You can actually extend your senses with um, less than a dollar with, uh, with the sensors that detect your hand when you dry your hands. 
those senses could be replaced. You put them in your, as an earring and then you can sense what's behind you. It's willing or not to merge with technology, the main uh, social aspect. There's many people that uh, don't want or still feel that it's not natural to do it. So I think the, maybe where we'll see more cyborgs will actually be in places like Africa where they have a culture of uh, designing themselves or also in tribes in South America where they are more open-minded to actually merge or modify or design themselves. Whereas in other places like Europe, it might be slower because people are, are less comfortable with doing this. But I don't think it's, it will be a matter of money because uh, it's also getting cheaper, uh, everything. And Trevor, do you, do you um, experience or do you have experience of the disparity of access because of the cost of the technology? Uh, yes, absolutely. The, um, uh, some of my patients that use the, the myelitric arms that you've probably seen in the papers, um, they cost between, for my patients, about fifty to $70,000. And uh, they're put on the, um, the, the very wealthy. Um, but there is a lot of research going on to create something very similar through 3D printing to make it more affordable for, for everybody. And maybe the cost will come down to you know $1,000 or a couple of thousand dollars. So there's, there's hope. I have two questions uh, that, to, um, to our cyberman. <laughs> Do you actually hear the sounds that you, that you, uh, and the second question, if you hear the sounds, can you switch it off? Because it must, just imagining it, it would drive me crazy to have this background noise of all the colors around me and then also having to listen to. Well, it's an inner sound, so I hear through my ears, but this is a vibration inside my skull that becomes a sound. So it's an, a different from hearing. Um, it's like thinking of sound more than hearing sound. So it doesn't interfere with what I'm hearing. Uh, but the closest way of describing it is that I'm hearing color, but I'm actually feeling the vibration of color inside my head and then it becomes an inner sound. So I, if I was completely deaf, I could still feel the colors uh, in my head. So it's a new sense, but in order to describe it uh, I, I say that I hear color because that's the closest, yeah. But I, I do hear the vibrations inside, yeah. Other questions? Uh, so there is one in the corner back there. Hello, thanks a lot for all three very interesting talks. Um, I'd have a question to you, Neil, how, in fact, two questions. One is, uh, how do you deal with, uh, well, energy issues, batteries for the different implants, uh, or energy harvesting? And the second question would be, how do you deal with cybersecurity? Have you ever been hacked? <laughs> yeah, having internet as a sense brings up the open door that someone could hack me. So. For the last uh, years, it has only happened once that someone without permission sent an image to my head. So I was physically hacked once, but I actually liked it. So it was a, it was a good experience. Uh, it wasn't a bad experience. Uh, if it became problematic, then I could do security much harder. So it would, I could make it less uh, hackable. And if someone still was able to hack me and uh, annoy me, then I would turn off the internet. The internet, I can switch off the internet connection. So that would be it. And the other question was, uh, ah, battery. I, most of these implants can be charged from the outside with external coil, some with batteries. Uh, the aim for, for me is to use a turbine in the blood vessel, though. It's to use blood circulation to charge the antenna, so that it's constantly charging. But I still have to charge from the outside. So that's uh, one of the main goals is to be able to charge with your own body, not to use external energy, not even solar energy. Yeah. And I would just like to ask to Agatha, your, your work is so speculative and, and it's you know, um, help us to imagine the future of uh, potential futures. Do you think about the convergence of internet and medicine and what could happen? <laughs> I've had a lot of questions about what I would want to do if I decided to have a modification, but it's, I suppose this is the thing, I, it seems to me like the most interest that I've had actually in creating something new has been from the transgender and uh, transsexual communities who are 
sort of saying, oh, well, when I was a child, maybe it would have been helpful to think about that. So it's, there, are, there have been a lot of suggestions for what people might do to their children. So there's probably a lot of other opportunities. Yeah. Um, or, oh, yes, a question over there. Hi, my question's for Agatha. Um, so kind of going off of what you just said, uh, how does morality come into play for your practice? Are there certain boundaries that you wouldn't cross or um, that you do decide to cross or you feel able to cross because your work is so speculative? Yeah, I suppose that's the thing. It, yeah, it's, I've been slightly nervous in the past uh, about suggesting something because a lot of my research interests are about how images might influence decision making. So it's quite nerve wracking doing the type of work that is visually stimulating like this so that people might change their opinions. But I suppose this is what Oren Katz was talking about earlier in terms of contestable design. If you're doing something, uh, you, you know, you can, I suppose maybe my work is slightly different in terms of I'm not actually involving myself in the physical life forms. So I'm trying to take a step away because this isn't something that I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting this is something that we should do at all. Um, yeah, it's a question. Um, over there, first, yeah. First, thank you so much. Uh, I just had my mind blown today. This was just amazing. All three speakers, I just, wow, this was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Trevor, and you began your talk with uh, a sensitivity to, to the issues, you know, when you've got people from different countries uh, who don't have access to the same technology, and you, and you felt quite strongly about it. And I'd be interested to put the issue that, um, what if you had to make a medical decision to be putting through an implant that was somewhat, well, I wouldn't say cosmetic, but, you know, for instance, the example when you had to, uh, where the lady was, uh, uh, put, had put in an implant to perceive earthquakes. Ethically, as a doctor, would you have uh, um, any issues with that? Uh, firstly, thank you for the question. Secondly, I'm not a doctor. Um, but uh, I'll try to answer it as best as I can. Um, one, one of the things I sometimes ask my colleagues is, if you had to amputate a finger, which finger would you amputate and why? And it often stimulates a lot of discussion about replacement as well. So what would you replace? What, what is the function that's lost when you've lost the thumb versus the little finger versus the middle finger versus the, the, the index finger? And they all have their role to play. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I would be keen to implant anything and, and, and modify the way that my body was intended to be. Uh, I guess it's probably the bias that I have from the profession that I'm in, where I try to um, replace what's been, what's been taken away, um, or, or for those unfortunate ones that are born that way, try to uh, improve their lives as much as possible. So I, I, probably, um, I, I probably would consider something like the OSSO integration that I mentioned in my talk, where I could implant the, the, uh, the titanium rod into my leg, uh, maybe for, for comfort, but that's probably based on the fact that how many patients I've fitted over the years and, and you know, hundreds of them have complained of different types of pressure problems with the socket and there's still no ideal solution for that yet. So, so this probably comes the closest uh, to an implant that I would consider. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, two more questions over there. Hello, so usually when we think about reproduction, we usually think of like natural reproduction, but in the future I can see us uh, reproducing in other ways, maybe through like mechanical means, maybe we can create something like a, uh, a machine that's smarter than us and uh, maybe like we integrate it with human create a cyborg. So, but there's always this natural resistance for us humans to think of reproduction as something that's natural and for, against cyborgs, for, uh, like we have this natural resistance against things of people as cyborgs. So uh, what do you think can be done to overcome this natural resistance of integrating like uh, mechanical devices in our bodies so that we can become cyborgs? Yeah, this, this is my question. It can be directed at anyone. Yeah. It is the uh, is the question when when w what is the, the the border between nature and cyborgs? 
Yeah, uh, because I, I think that even amongst us, there's a, a lot of uh, resistance against the idea that in the future, human beings can be partially integrated with robots. So uh, uh, there's, there's, there's definitely some kind of backlash from society. So I'm thinking, uh, what can be done to mitigate this, this effect? Uh, maybe we can start with Neil, because I think maybe he has experienced some of it. Yeah. I, I suppose Neil is kind of proof that it started to happen. And, and I think as well, and be in, I mean, maybe this is an extension of your question. I'd be kind of interested to know from your perspective if you would think that people, for example, with a pacemaker are also cyborgs or not. Again, uh, being a cyborg or not being a cyborg is a feeling. Uh, if someone feels he or she is a cyborg, then he or she is a cyborg, regardless of their body. In the same way that if I say that I am a woman, uh, I am a woman, regardless of my body. If you are or you feel that you are a cyborg, then you are a cyborg. Some people might have uh, the, the will to have a biological body of a cyborg, which would be then to add these senses or organs that they feel they should have. Uh, and some others might not. But I do receive lots of emails from young, uh, very young people, like 11, 12 year olds who identify as a cyborg and they want to have the body of the cyborg when they are 18, but they already identify as cyborg. And, um, uh, yep, and I, I define myself as a trans species because um, uh, the definition of human no longer defines me completely. Uh, if you see the definition, I have an antenna, uh, whereas the human body doesn't have an antenna, but I have an antenna. So uh, I also have infrared and ultraviolet perception, which is not uh, traditionally human. So I've added senses and organs that are typical for other species. So that's why I consider myself a trans species. And the surgery was a trans species surgery because it was adding organs and senses that are not traditional of our species. So I think that there'll be more and more people identifying as trans species or cyborgs. Uh, and that they will also e e change their bodies in order to feel that what they identify as corresponds to their body. Okay, let's do uh, this one first on the second line. Yeah. Hi, just a comment and a quick question. Um, the comment is that I think um, today's talk is a good representation of um, what was socially accepted in the past, the prosthetics, you know, being fitted onto the legs, and then what's currently, I think, government, uh, what the government can recognize, you know, legally, and uh, Agatha would be what um, could be possible in the future. So maybe uh, the question would be, if let's say you had to um, um, make an augmentation to human body, let's say it's um, uh, to, to modify, um, maybe a young child, you know, let's say you had to make a modification um, in the future, I'm talking about, you know, a hypothetical case, then what, um, let's say regardless of uh, time, money or resource, if that was not um, a problem, then uh, maybe each of you can touch on one um, possible augmentation that you have been thinking about or that would be interesting. Thank you. Yeah, well, I suppose um, uh, more recently I've been doing some work with the, some neuroscientists, and I think what I find quite interesting is that there's this sort of hotly debated topic in neuroscience, whether we are just the sum of our neural network and how our neural network changes could house information about our memories or emotions. And sometimes I think it would be really fantastic if you could al yeah, alter the structure of your brain to change the way that you think. Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting uh, papers about, for example, how people uh, like, I think Einstein learned the violin and whether his brain was already uh, the right structure to be very good at playing the violin or whether he learned to play the violin but, uh, so, and his brain changed as a result. Um, so I think it would be really fantastic if you could change your brain to make yourself better at something. <laughs> Well, I, I wouldn't um, do anything to a child. I would not uh, add a sense or organ to anyone. I think it needs to be a self-decision. Someone, you need to decide if you want to have new senses and new organs. And uh, whenever they have used all their existing senses and organs, then they will, I guess, reach a time when they will want or not to extend their senses. And so, yeah, I wouldn't force it to any other species either. So. Uh, 
But yeah, there will be a point when children will be born with new organs. So in, in the case that this was added with my own DNA, so in the future when we can 3D print new organs, then this will be organic. And if I can modify my genes so I can have ultraviolet and infrared perception genetically modifying yourself, then if this person decides to have a child, then the child might be born with an antenna or with a... With, so that's a way of... Um, doing it without interfering. It's um, the freedom of having children. Uh, cyborgs sh should have the freedom to have children. So then if they have children, then uh, new mm, babies will be born with new organs and new senses. So that will be for sure the re renaissance of our species or the, we'll see families with specific senses and organs. Uh, so diversity, what we now call diversity is nothing compared to what might be coming soon. Uh, yeah, I guess, um, uh, like Neil said, I don't think I would, I would uh, change anything with the, the babies. I think um, they're, they're, they're born the way they're born, and in, in my line of work, I see, uh, you know, I guess I'm a, a head binder, if you want to put it that way. I do make helmets for babies um, to, 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 to make them nice and round, um, but that's a cosmetic thing. Uh, there are other ways to do it as well. Um, but. I guess I would be more interested in focusing on areas that could have perhaps early identification and then there, is there a way that we can reduce um, the disability that may come from um, uh, an, an, an abnormal birth. Um, but, but I'm a believer of the way you're born the way you're born and, and I think that um, uh, I've seen parents cope with the different difficulties that arise from that uh, as well as my patients. Um, and, and that's encouraging in a different way. Um, it's not necessarily being reliant on the self to improve, but um, seeing how those loved ones can also improve and change the way that they view you and perhaps go out and, and, and be a warrior for, for changing stereotypes as well. Just quickly, sorry, I was just going to quickly say, I think it's kind of interesting because I think we're already modifying children quite a lot. I mean, the decisions to circumcise your child for religious purposes or even making them eat certain things that will change the way their body develops is a modification in a way. And it's kind of interesting to think, like, you know, <laughs> is this... Uh, are, are we making decisions already to modify our children and this just seems slightly out of reach because it's not accepted by society yet? Uh, there. Uh, I have a question for Agatha. So what was the result of your experiment with the drone? Uh, of the drone? Did, did you say of the, the drone project? It's still, um, uh, it's still sort of ongoing, so the next step would be to take a series of MRI scans of my brain, um, or uh, sorry, fMRI scans over a number of, of weeks, and then compare it to the drone that would be on all the time, and see if, like, the, in, in, in a way it's more testing the viability of the artificial neural network and if it develops in the same way as my brain, but this is something that hasn't happened yet. So after it being in the gallery, we got a lot of quite depressing data back because it was in a dark space um, and it wasn't moving very much because it sort of broke. But since then, it's been in a gallery in, uh, in Australia and we got some slightly more interesting data from that. Yeah, it's got wings. So it's uh, because the trouble was to keep it in the air for a really long time. So it's filled with helium, but it's got wings, so from a distance it kind of looks like a puffer fish. It sort of does this really slowly. Yeah. So we have one more question there. Uh, this question is more of directed to Neil. So from my understanding, this, the, for example, your new, new sense uh, for the colors converting to some audio or some feeling vibration. So what you're really doing is that the new sense or perception is more like uh, an alteration of the basic senses. So it's like, so the color is being converted to some audible, so, and then the one you plan for the sense of time is, will be the heat, so it's more of your sense of feeling. I'm curious is if you are try if you will pursue that, you will really uh, try to 
uh, create a new sense that will go directly to the brain th so that it's a really unique uh, new perception or sense. Uh, are you going through that, to that direction or something? Well, it is a new sense because it's not hearing. And if I was deaf, blind, uh, if I had all of my senses uh, uh, disappearing, I would still sense color. So it is an uh, independent sense. I'm not using my hearing. I, as I said, if I was deaf, I could still uh, feel the vibrations inside my bone. So feeling vibrations inside the bone is stimuli going inside my body that is not related to any of my existing senses. But yeah, you could reduce all the senses are based on touch, even sight. When light touches your eye, then you, you get to see. When uh, air can, touches the, then you hear. When chemicals touch the, then you smell. When you touch your tongue, then you, you taste. All senses are based on touching your body. So you will need to uh, have some kind of input or uh, stimuli going in, I guess. Um, so that's, um, what was the question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if, you, if you can develop really a new kind of sense, but I think this But all senses need to have some stimuli touching your body, yeah. unless it's a thought. Or, and there's also many senses that don't have organs, so then you can create organs for senses. We have many senses, not five. We have maybe five or six sensory organs, but m many more senses, a sense of um, gravity, the sense of velocity, the sense, uh, sense of humor, uh, common sense <laughs> as well. So there's many senses that don't have organs. That's why in my, the, the, sen the case of uh, creating the sense of time is creating an organ for a, a sense that doesn't have an organ. So. Okay, we have time for uh, yeah, a couple of more questions. So. Hi, thanks for the great sessions. Um, to what extent are you guys thinking about things like CRISPR, which is you know gene and genome editing, uh, to further sort of enhance what you guys are already working on? One example I can think of is Trevor in your case uh, to sort of you know uh, overcome the infection problem that your patients may face with uh, the titanium screws. Are you thinking of that? If yes, exactly. What are you doing about it? Oh, I'm, I'm like you, I'm just waiting for the technology to come along. Um, I, I think there's, there's a lot of research that's being done to, to overcome a lot of the barriers that prosthetics currently have. And um, they're done all over the world. So yeah, I, I'm often not surprised when patients come to see me and they tell me about a new technology. It's very hard for prosthetists to stay up to date. Um, it's probably one of the only professions that's championed by a lot of engineers and they're working in a different lab to us. So we sometimes bring it to the, to the patient, but there's actually a lot of research being done elsewhere. So there are uh, things, like I mentioned, where they're trying to um, change the tissue structure around the, the uh, implant um, to improve infection rates. What does that mean? No. Um, but they're, they're, they're new technologies. Uh, the implants that you saw in the slides, they take about nine months before a patients are able to walk on them. Uh, that's the, the typical one, but there are faster times in places like Australia, which I think is around the three-month mark. Um, but, you know, prosthetists usually question if you can, if you can fer make a third of the time, um, what are you compromising on? So um, we, we tend to sit and wait and see what's happening. Uh, we don't tend to um, dictate what's going to happen. We may dictate in terms of feedback, uh, what the patients are feeling with the rest of their componentry and how that connects to what the surgeons are trying to do, but we, we don't necessarily involve ourselves at a cellular level. Yeah. Perfect, thank, thank you so much. Um, I have one question for you. How does human plus sound like? Can I add? <laughs> mm. Yeah, there's a, a very silent, because white is silent, I like a glass of milk. So it, it has a lot of silence around, but then there's the sections that divide, the different zones have different notes, so I really like crossing these sections, because it changes the sound, so I like that. Wow, thank you. So, uh, well, thank you so much to uh, Neil, Trevor, and, and Agatha. It's been an, an incredible session and a wonderful uh, a day. Um, I will um, leave uh, to honor to conclude this, this fantastic day. Um, my personal thanks has been an incredibly uh, interesting and, and learning uh, uh, exercise. As I said, this complements very well the exhibition. It really shows that there is a lot to talk about and a lot to discuss about uh, the future of human species. So uh, on my 
uh, from my part, thank you so much, Honor. And uh, um. Um, can we also have a big round of applause for our co-chair, Andrew Bandelli? And we're enormously grateful to all of you for being with us today for um, the launch of Human, uh, of Human Plus, the Future of Our Species and the Future Sapiens Conference. We know that there's been a lot of you here all day and some of you have even been sitting on the floor and standing at the back and thank you for your dedication and commitment to sticking with us through the whole day. But I think you'd agree that it's been worth it for everything that we've heard, which has really pushed the boundaries of our understanding of you know, what humanity is now and what it might evolve into. Um, we urge you to go and see the exhibition and do imagine as you're walking through it how it, how it sounds and the very thoughtful white notes that we've kind of put in the exhibition so that you have these moments of silence. Um, and, and please tell us what you think. You know, as Andrea Bandelli has, has said many times in the presentation of this exhibition, it's really intended to start conversations. You know, it's really intended uh, to ask questions. And we're interested in your ideas and your feedback um, so please get online, share your ideas on Facebook. Um, we've got a hashtag if you want to Instagram or Twitter, which is ASM Human Plus. Um, and this is just the beginning of a program of events that we're staging to kind of animate and bring out ideas for the exhibition. Next Saturday, we're welcoming to Singapore one of the true pioneers of art and technology, Stalak. Um, so at the same time next Saturday, He'll be here, and he'll be in dialogue with Professor Steve Dixon, who's the president of La Salle. So if you enjoyed what you heard today, please come back. Um, and otherwise, we thank you all so much for coming. Thanks.